Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Ontario Aquaculture Research Centre. I'm your host, Kaylee Moore, one of the agricultural assistants here at OARC. If you're looking to learn more about aquaculture, you're in the right place. On today's episode, we have Jennifer Bushman joining us today to talk about her role in the aquaculture industry and how it's playing a part in the development of ethical, sustainable aquaculture. Hi guys and welcome back to our channel. I'm so excited to introduce Jennifer Bushman. She is a strategy consultant to those hoping to be or currently engaged in sustainable ethical aquaculture. She insists by stepping into complex situations and developing cogent, coherent plans of action that help farmers achieve success. Each strategy consulting project is unique and individual as we know, but the goal is the same. Best in class farming meet business solutions leading to market success. So Jennifer, you have been a huge advocate for ethical, sustainable aquaculture. So before I even dig into my questions for I have for you today, can you kind of tell us a little bit about yourself and your experiences? Well, I mean, like all careers, it's a winding road, right? And so I definitely never expected that I would be involved in this. I mean, I was a lover of food. I actually started out, I had a cooking school and I was teaching people about, you know, how to create solutions, meal solutions at home. I did a show for Food Network and wrote some cookbooks. And one day my agent called and said, we think we're going to bring to market the most sustainable ocean raised salmon that the market's ever seen. And we think you're the one to help do it. And that was 12 years ago. So that was before the Aquaculture Stewardship Council really had taken hold. It was before Seafood Watch had really gotten involved in some of these saying yes, possibly yellow or green to some of these large farms. And and we were off and running. Now, in the beginning, I was definitely working on lots of content, trying to have more engagement, you know, with consumers while getting buyers to do that uptake about talking about farmed fish. Um, I think the first year I actually handed out samples, more than 20,000 samples of Verlasso salmon all by myself. So you can imagine it. It takes all types of effort, incredible team. And um, and now, wow, here we are working with incredible companies. I've had just all different species. And to see the industry and the direction it's going has just been a great thing to be able to be a part of and to witness. I think it's incredible, uh, 12 years of experience uh, advocating and working with aquaculture to see the growth. Um, I, uh, as through these interviews, people have learned that I am such a noob to the aquaculture industry. I love that. That's awesome. That's what we need. We need you. <laughs> but coming into it, I, I was, it's really exciting to see the growth that is still continuing to happen um, and just the work everybody is doing to create more sustainable and uh, creating new technologies to make a better aquaculture industry. And I think it's fantastic. And I think there needs to be more and more conversations out there to really share the word, because I know for myself, it's something I've missed over the past couple of years that I didn't really find access to. So that's a big point of, you know, starting this series is to share that and, you know, to continue the growth because, you know, even for yourself, you've put in 12 hours. 12 years of effort and we shouldn't just stop at 12 years. We should keep going, which I think is yeah. fantastic. So much, so, to, so much more to do. Yeah. So to quote you, it's time to be honest about how you get your fish and seafood. If you want to eat sustainably, aquaculture has to be a part of the conversation. I really love that you've said that, but what does that mean kind of for you personally? Well, let's, let's talk about the fact that, you know, it, 12 years ago, it really was a farmed or wild story. And we, you know, had to get in there and kind of have those conversations. And for me, it was, you know, you can farm chicken well and you can farm chicken badly. And we've learned to accept that. Why do we have this consumptive entitlement about fish and seafood that it should just be from the ocean? And the reality is, you know, there are 4.6 million boats commercial fishing in our oceans every single day. You know, the oceans are 90 percent either fish to capacity or outside of capacity, over capacity. So we know we can't continue. But the good news now is that I feel like those conversations are getting a little bit easier. There's more mainstream media involved. There are a lot of people that are working hard in different technologies and all different types of solutions that didn't exist 
10 or 12 years ago. So I feel blessed to have a conversation about AI technology from Google, where you can, you can actually track every single fish and know them by face and by name if you wanted, you know, because that's the kind of thing that we need and that we're hungry for is we want provenance. We want storytelling. We want to be able to say, look, it's not a it's not a depletive resource. We can do this in the right way and really create a sustainable food system that we're going to need in the future with less carbon footprint, less inputs. Everything suggests to us that aquaculture can fulfill that promise. And I think that's fantastic. And I think right now we're coming to a generation that people are caring about, you know, uh, where their food is coming from and how it's farmed and really putting the full circle into picture and really understanding that. And I think, um, you know, getting that out there for people to see and understand is perfect timing with kind of where we're currently sitting in our uh, environment and with our circumstances in life and with a growing population. I think people are becoming more aware and more concerned. So I think this aligns really well. But your passion is to work with aquatic farmers at all levels and you and have said that aquaculture done well can be a force of ecological and social good. So not just knowing where your fish is coming from and your seafood, but like knowing that it's done well. What does good aquaculture done? Well, I should say more. What does aquaculture done well look like? It's a great it's a great question. And and so for, you know, the average consumer, it's following groups like Seafood Watch, getting on. You have to be engaged. I mean, the one thing about it is that it's not quite as simple as organic, natural and commodity chicken. You know, you've got to look at where your fish and seafood is coming from, <clears throat> whether harvested or reared. You know, we have to know the background. And that gets a little bit complicated. That's the reality. So for me, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for things like antibiotic and chemical free. I'm looking at feed models that are not depletive of feeder fish, I'm looking at using trim in feed models, better types of algae to give us better nutrition. I'm thinking about things like marine mammal policy, if you're talking about ocean reared fish, and if you're, and you know, and better gear and equipment so that, so that we have the tools to make sure that we're in that environment of the ocean, but we're also being conscientious of our other family members like those marine mammals and cetaceans that are in the water with us. So I'm thinking about those things. Um, and it excites me because aquaculture can fulfill that promise. And if we're talking about on land, because it's gonna take everything, right? It's going to take all of these solutions. So land-based farms where we know that those systems are um, being run on green energy, where they're using good recirculating systems so that they have better water use, all of those things. So it's, so yes, it's, what I hope is if we do the heavy lifting and, and the way I look at my role is kind of like the conductor. I mean, I can't play every single instrument well. So if I'm talking about technology, like referencing that AI technology, if I'm talking about technology, I'm going to find that guy. You know, if we're talking about laser technology to fight sea lice, I'll find that woman. You know, but it's but it's a type of situation where once I get all of those pieces into place, what I think I bring is a different voice, a different kind of music. I know how the music should sound as the conductor when we hit all of the right notes. And hitting the right notes means that we're not taking away from our environment, but we're behaving as contributors to be able to put back. And so that's what we need. We will eat wild fish in the future, We'll eat farmed, we'll eat plant-based, we'll eat cell-based. It's going to take all different types of contribution to be a contributor rather than thinking of ourselves. And that's the words of my friend, Alexandra Cousteau. In the words she will say is to be a contributor in, our, in what we demand, not consumers. That is an outdated phrase given where we are on the planet. I think that's really fantastic that if you're talking about the... Um and a perspective of a higher end, like finding the technologies to know what's best and um, for, you know, animal health and things like that, finding those professionals. And I think looking at it in a workplace setting, uh, specifically, we can look here, you know, having um, not only the facility maintain and manage correctly for, you know, best practices, but hiring staff that are going above and beyond to, you know, fulfill all those duties within the facility to make sure that everything is running smoothly rather than, you know, finding people who do band-aid fixes or things like that, that, you know, Absolutely. just get through. But 
people who want to be here and are passionate about being in the aquaculture industry. And those people are out there and exist. And I think having the people do the work above and doing the research, I mean, that's what our facility is here for. We do research to help fish farmers, you know, to adapt and grow and um, better practices. Um, but it's, it, takes, it takes the whole village to uh, continue to grow and I think it's fantastic. Um, it does, and I just want to say, it's also our responsibility to build this as a new food system because it's relatively new. I mean, we've been farming for thousands of years, farming fish for thousands of years, but we have an opportunity now at scale to build a food system in aquaculture the way we want it to be, which means that we can do things like the Quarry Arctic Women in, Sco Women in Aquaculture Scholarship Fund, and we can help support more diversity through you know, black and brown communities and teach them how to be able to to start to or learn from them in terms of how to create systems that are best for where they are. And aquaculture can fight nutritional injustice. So not only can it be economically a stronghold, it can also help support the support women in terms of diversity, but it can also fight nutritional injustice because we can put things like tilapia farms in areas of the world like Africa, where by if there are 10 billion people on the planet as predicted by 2050, 4 billion will be in Africa. And if we can teach them how to rear tilapia, which is a heritage fish there, we can be, again, contributive to their food systems. So the things that I look at are, yes, now we can't rob the environment of things. We can't have bad um, animal husbandry practices. And we have to think about how we're going to contribute to help people um, economically and socially. And that's where people, that's where organizations like Fair Trade come in. And I'm so excited about Fair Trade's role in, um, in what's going to be their aquaculture track. Because Fair Trade USA, like they have done with coffee and chocolate, will be very important in what we'll look to to the future of aquaculture. Yeah, like here in Ontario, um, Canada, we're specifically, we work with uh, like BAP, like Best Aquaculture Practices. Um, and there's, you know, um, another one is Ocean Wise. We yes. are Ocean Wise certified. And Ocean Wise, their goal is kind of to loop everything. So from, you know, a rearing facility, so like a hatchery to the grow out phase to um, the people who then you know, sell the fish and it's a full chain of being, you know, ocean wise certified. And that's saying, you know, everybody who's certified is doing the best thing possible to prove that they're doing, you know, best aquaculture practices and just giving the consumer and uh, anyone looking in saying, yes, like they're doing this right and it's sustainably and we can trust what this logo means. And I and think you have to, it has to be one stop shopping. I mean, it can't look like I keep saying, I'm taking this um, phrase from another friend, but, you know, it can't look like a NASCAR list of sponsors at the bottom of the car. You know, we don't know what all those are. We've got to make sure that we're doing the right work so that the heavy lifting is done for the consumer. And Best Aquaculture Practices is a great example where Seafood Watch didn't take it all the way to market. It only took it from the farm and didn't guarantee that you had that market assurance. But blockchain will. And so working with IBM Food Trust blockchain and others where you can scan a QR code and know exactly every single step that fish made from hatchery to plate is going to, I mean, and Quarry Arctic is a group, I mean, I work with them and we're using blockchain technology already to help us with that. Yeah, we here at our facility are using a, a computer system called Aqua Manager. So we um, use pit tags in our rainbow trout brood. So we are able to literally watch a fish grow from an egg to grow out. And then, you know, it's fantastic to be able to follow, follow that individual um, all the way through. And then, you know, uh, say we have a distributor or something like that, that were to purchase our rainbow trout, um, that information can be transitioned into their aqua manager database. So they can then see the history that, you know, our fish has had, which I think is fantastic in tracking all things that we are using in our facility, uh, whether if you are using anything like, you know, antibiotics and stuff like that. I mean, we don't tend to use anything, but like stuff like that, but we're able to input all the information and leave nothing behind and make sure that anyone can have access to that information. And I think it's really fascinating to see the technology, not only from a physical aspect, like out in a net pens and things like that, that they're using to, you know, track fish and seeing their face and seeing their behaviors to the stuff that's um, 
like you're saying, the heavy work, you know, on the computer and stuff like that. So people like myself who are running around feeding fish and cleaning tanks, it makes it easier for us to identify and, you know, place those specific information to a specific tank, which I think is fantastic and one only organizing us and making sure we're on the right page, but to also it benefits the fish itself and being able to identify things as they're happening, not after it's happened. Mm -hmm. But you recently published a documentary called Full Full Circle. What was your inspiration behind that? So that was a few years, that was a couple of years ago, but there's been 1.2 million downloads of that film. And Full Circle Journey of a Waterman is the story of a 10-time world champion surfer and paddleboarder, Jamie Mitchell, and his discovery of aquaculture. And the inspiration of it really was, so my husband it was on the board for Surfline, which is the largest wave mechanism um, in the world that surfers, boaters, everyone use. There's an app. You go on that and, and, and you look to see where the waves are. And as I looked at what the influence was of the surf community, how much fish and seafood they ate, how people really followed them. That, I mean, you have, a, you have a more than, you know, a middle income, but an upper middle income group of individuals that are very um, clear about what they love and don't love, right? But they really don't think about their office. If you're a professional surfer, your office every single day is the ocean. And it really amazed me that we didn't see much more than picking up trash on the beach at the time when, you know, we started to produce that film. So my motivation for it was to show someone that a lot of people could relate to. Jamie was an amazing champion of aquaculture and still is. And that we could show it through the lens where, listen, if he can go in and swim with those fish at Pacifico Aquaculture, you would know how beautiful the waters were when he talks about it being pristine like a mountain lake when he was swimming with the fish. So it gives you this uh, impression of maybe a farm you've never seen. And you've got this guy that is, you know, uh, important in this er- in this expertise that maybe you you can at least have a ro- sort of a romantic feeling about as a surfer. And then there he is swimming with the fish and you're just like, it's amazing. And so the impact that that had in starting conversations like with Quicksilver, his sponsors came on board, we did tours, we actually had premieres for that. And it was just a really amazing way to shine a unique light on something that we needed to be talking about. Yeah, I think that's a, I actually just watched the documentary a couple weeks ago. Um, and yeah, I think it's very fascinating and a really good tool to, yeah, uh, open a conversation up with maybe a specific group of people that aquaculture is not even on their radar. Right. And, um, you know, and this kind of leads into like the next question. You know, we at here at OARC, we believe that seafood production should not be viewed as us for them. We believe there's a place for sustainable wild harvest and for aquatic farming. So how do we unify the seafood world and what does that look like in your opinion? Well, I mean, I just wrote a blog, maybe you saw it, about um, the great seafood divide. I mean, I would love it so much if I was sitting showing my farmers and all of their hard work um, at a table with fishers so that we could see what that looks like as we support one another. I think Pacifico aquaculture is a great example of that. You have fishers that had essentially fished out their tuna fishery in northern Mexico in um, Isla Todos Santos off the coast of Ensenada. And the tuna cannery that was used for that abundance. And then now how that farm, which is the only farm in the world farming striped bass, Um, has been able to put those fishers back to work by boats, buy them out of their boats. So you think about how important it is for a fisher, if they've got all their money in their boat, they're almost tied to that industry no matter what they do. But if someone comes in and buys them out of the boat and says, here's some money for you to be able to have a new start, even the offices are in that tuna cannery that was the old, that was, you know, abandoned essentially. So this is a way to provide solutions. I think in Maine, we're seeing the same thing with seaweed farmers and shellfish farmers instead of those that were out doing a wild caught cod as the fishery moved. So aquaculture can provide us with this dialogue if someone will allow it. And remember, we're not talking about a red rated commodity, rape and pillage the environment type of conversation. We're talking about 
third generation family salmon farmers, you know, that are the oldest finfish farmers in the world that are doing it right in the Arctic Circle, wanting to talk to a salmon fisher. Well, it was their great grandfather that was the fisher before that. And wouldn't have become the farmer had the stocks of salmon stayed the same. So I think we we swim in the same waters. We all want to contribute to the food system. Everybody needs to make a living. So wouldn't it be important to say it's not an us versus them mentality? And with this next generation, people like you starting conversations earlier, people getting more used to eating farmed fish, we're, we're getting there. But, you know, I'm hard pressed and I would give anything for it to find an Alaskan salmon fisher that would meet my salmon farmer from the Arctic. And I've been trying and no one answers my emails. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, it is a huge conversation. I'm sure we could do a whole chat about it, um, about, you know, us for them. I do a little uh, pre-skit. I did a talk to uh, Lawrence Gunther. He has the Bluefish Radio Show. and. He, uh, he focuses more on sustainable angling and what that looks like in the fisheries. And I think um, we see that all the time is aquaculture sometimes gets looped into the same category as fisheries. And, you know, aquaculture is not fisheries. It's agriculture because we are producing, you know, food for human consumption. And I think in the end of between fisheries and with, you know, aquaculture, our goals are the same and it's being sustainable and having sustainable populations of fish for future generations. And I think it would be fantastic to see, you know, like you're saying, your aquaculture guy and that fisher out in uh, Alaska sit down and talk and be able to, you know, work together so that, you know, there is a world where we both exist continually as we go on in this world, as, a, you know, our population continues to grow because, you know, we don't, I mean, aquaculture really lifts the pressure off of those wild stocks. If people aren't just looking for, you know, wild caught fish, it still allows for that market to be there because they'll always still be there. I mean, personally, myself, I love camping. I love fishing. I grew up, you know, eating wild fish. But since coming into the aquaculture world, I think, okay, there's a place for both. And you can make those decisions more um, conscious and aware of what's happening. And I think, you know, it'd be a great time and place and I think we'll eventually hopefully get there and uh, hopefully you know you get some emails answered and you can <laughs> get exactly. that table gathered together but yeah it's uh, it's a hardship and I think it's you know uh, we can hear kind of you know back in the day and things like that it was, it's the way it is and change is really hard and I know it's hard for a lot of people and um I grew up in a family where agriculture is huge in the the beef industry and, you know, I see my own grandfather, you know, things are never going to change and it's the way it's going to be and, you know, they're stuck in their, not stuck in their ways, but they have a way that they follow and um, I think, yeah, having a younger generation, you know, confront their grandparents, you know, confront their parents and have those hard conversations about, you know, the the decisions they're making and what they can do moving forward to make sure that uh, there's a place for both. So yeah, it's going to take all. But, but I, yeah, another thing I did want to mention that I personally think is a great tool for those who are looking to create a more sustainable pantry at home is you've created the Sea Pantry. Can you explore some of those products and ideas with us today? Yeah, the sea pantry kind of came out of my cookbook series because I always had a pantry that was in there of like things you should keep on hand. So the freezer, the refrigerator, and the cabinets, all things that would contribute to your getting a meal on the table whenever you wanted it. I mean, that's how our grandparents cooked, was we kept things on hand. We didn't just think about a meal on our way home from work at five o'clock. We knew that there would always be these ingredients to cook from. And in and and I'm older than you are. And in the day when I was writing my cookbooks, there was the Italian pantry, olive oil and semolina flour made, you know, pasta made from semolina flour and t Italian tomatoes. It was really like balsamic vinegar. These have become the things that we consider part of our everyday pantry now. 
And so during COVID, I was trying to kind of connect the dots. And I said, you know, items from the sea, seaweed, things that are regenerative aquaculture, as well as using the freezer as a pantry, more conservice, ten, tin seafood, it has got to become a part of our everyday pantry. Because we think of fish and seafood as a fresh item, you, 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 you buy it, then you need to make it, and then you're thinking about what you need to make the next time. So if we keep these items on hand, and I really tried to go back to my cookbook days, write new recipes or adapt recipes, use more regenerative aquaculture in this with things like seaweed, and help people build a pantry to add seaweed like you all have put balsamic vinegar in there. We don't even think of the difference now. So that's what Sea Pantry is. All of this content, segments, everything that help you become contributors by the way in which that you're eating and you're sourcing. So that's that's Sea Pantry. We're just working really hard at trying to get people inspired by sustainable, ethical items from the sea that can help us fight climate change. Yeah, and I know I'm sure some people watching this may not even follow you on Instagram, um, but I'll share your handle in a moment here. But um, there's products out there that people don't even know exist. I know I didn't even know some of them existed. So you do have some really helpful tips and tricks. And I think um, this is a great opportunity for people to kind of look in and see what else is out there so that you can have these have these things on hand um, and not just thinking, you know, um, I know we do this all the time, but it's like, okay, what's the groceries for the week? What do we need right. to have? What do we need to get? But, you know, if we have these items in our pantry and stuff like that, those that is going to be steps ahead rather than, you know, feeling you need to have, you know, fresh or things like that. There's um, so many delicious ingredients, so many delicious ingredients that we're all missing out on because we think that, oh, if, if it's made from bulk help from Alaska and it's a salsa, we're not going to like it. And all I've done is just reached and stretched and ordered these things and come up with recipes. There are things I keep on hand. I'm not tied to any of the companies. I just have curiosity conversations like we're having to try to build this pantry so that we can raise a generation of people that get used to eating these types of ingredients. Because if we don't start now, we're going to run out of time. I mean, we'll be at, you know, we'll be at much, we'll be up and over that 1.5 degrees Celsius mark by 2030, and it will have gone by like that. And there are things that you can be doing now in your everyday eating that can help make you a contributor. And that's really where we need to go. I think what's really fascinating that I uh, recently learned is I took an actual algae aquaculture course. Uh -huh. So I learned about sea seaweed and uh, it was miraculous. Like, you know, the eating in salads and things like that. You don't think of that stuff, especially here. And I mean, for goodness sakes, I grew up in a very modern day, you know, farming life where it was, you know, meat, potatoes, and a vegetable, we, you know, those seaweed and seafood conversations didn't necessarily happen. You know, my mom wasn't putting some seaweed in our salads, you know, that's not something uh, we necessarily talk about. But I think it is very cool what you can do with other items, not just fish, but mm -hmm. other seafood, um, kelp, things like that you can include vegetable, in your life that yeah, are super vegetables. positive. There's just so many things. And remember that we know that these types of ingredients will sequester more carbon than any tree that you plant on land. So the idea of ocean reforestation while also contributing to the food system is new, but it is something that is within our grasp and it can happen in a relatively, because of how fast the crops grow, it can, it can actually happen in a relatively short amount of time to be able to truly, truly yeah. change that direction. So Anyway, it's been so great to talk to you, though. I appreciate you having me so much. No problem. I did have one more question for you before we sign off. Do you still have time? Yeah, just another minute or two. Okay, well, I just wanted to talk about COVID-19. You created that no-show fish show. Do you want to share what this outline forum is for? Yeah, you know, I mean, I did that because... There was, an, there was an old way of doing business that was called the no-show food show where different distributors all throughout the East Coast would like 
put their wares on special and just call people or even put them in the back of a truck and go sell them. So to me, when we had Cena canceled, when we had a lot of our events canceled, No Show Fish Show was like, what are you doing to be able to change the way in which you're reaching out to your customers? What are you doing now that you're not virtual, that you're together at events, you have to do things virtually? It was a way to inspire out of the box thinking to be able to stay connected as an industry. Perfect. If you don't already, head over to Jennifer's Instagram at Jen underscore Bushman, where she shares recipes, tips on how to store sustainable fish and seafood, sustainable seafood pantry items for healthy living and healthy oceans. Everything we talked today is linked in the description below. I want to thank you, Jennifer, so much for joining me today and sharing the amazing work you are doing in sustainable aquaculture importance. Oh my gosh, it's so nice to meet you and go, go, go. We need you. We need everyone around you. This is going to take, it's a, it's a right, you know, this rising tide will take all boats, right? A rising tide lifts all boats. So we're going to get there, stay in the fight. And thank you so much for having me. Hey guys, I hope you liked the video today. If you did, please swim on over and hit the like button and subscribe. Comment below if you have any questions you want answered in any of our future videos. Hope to see you next time.